and thank you for tuning into Brand Plus TV. It's always a delight knowing that you have taken your time and are keeping us company. My name is Ondiro Ganga, ready to bring you up to speed with all the top stories making headlines. And as you know, we're all about business. Here's a glance of those stories. For the Kenyan case, uh, probably a safer approach will be to do what is called sandbox regulation. Public forum on cryptocurrency in Kenya. Cryptocurrencies make it to national dialogue as public forum is held. Fuel tax, long queues and heightened anxiety as the fuel levy takes effect. Fuel tax, what next? Time for the nation to look for other means of powering the economic engine. Now on to our top story. The Kenyan financial sector has realized growth buoyed by developments and dynamics in technology. Cryptocurrencies, which are gaining traction in ordinary business transactions, the regulatory environment notwithstanding, is one such technology. Noting the importance and growth of these digital currencies, the Institute of Economic Affairs today held a public forum on cryptocurrencies in Kenya to examine what these developments portend for the economy. Take a look at that report. While the rest of the world has caught up with digital currencies, with countries such as Venezuela, South Korea, Japan, among many others fully embracing cryptocurrencies and even transacting daily businesses with them, one cannot help but wonder what is the reality of digital currency in the country. Um, I think it's an emerging field. There's still a lot to learn um, in terms of the technology and also the risks because it is um, it's a new technology so um, lots of awareness that is needed and that's why I'm saying there's still a lot of to learn but some people have already invested um, early adopters and uh, I think those are the ones we should be learning from but then again we need uh, policies and regulations because of the risks that I've mentioned um, and also because of the um, concerns around monetary policy um, and, and, and which cannot be ignored. Cryptocurrencies are a volatile stock. However, as the saying goes, high risk, high returns. Jared Osoro, Director of Research and Policy, Kenya Bankers Association, says there are vast opportunities for the financial sector to leverage on in the cryptocurrency world. Technology needs to be seen in the broader context of what fintech has to offer uh, insofar as uh, the financial markets are concerned. And fintech has been proven in the recent past to be one of the enablers insofar as supporting efficiency is concerned. So it's in that context that we need to see the blockchain technology as an enabler in terms of promoting efficiencies and in terms of promoting uh, the move towards reducing the payment cycle. So there's plenty of opportunity in that context because uh, if you have a system that is decentralized and decentralized in a manner that is safe, uh, then I think that comes with a sense of efficiencies uh, that I've alluded to in terms of uh, concluding transactions uh, and reducing the payment cycle. In March, the president set up a blockchain task force whose mandate was to draw a blockchain and artificial intelligence roadmap for the country. However, Central Bank Governor Dr. Patrick Njoroge does not share the same enthusiasm for digital currencies, terming them as risky and unregulated. It is this lack of regulation that has seen investors suffer massive losses occasioned by digital fraud. The scams have been there for a long time. Personally, I've lost about 3 million Kenya shillings out of them all. And what I've really learned is that you need to learn token metrics. If you don't know token metrics, you will get scammed because we don't have any government really looking into the businesses which are jumping into our ecosystem. Judging from the potential that digital currencies have shown since inception, experts are coming up with legal frameworks that can support the use of cryptocurrencies as alternative value storage and equally protect cryptocurrency investors. For the Kenyan case, uh, probably a safer approach will be to do what is called sandbox regulation. So you create a regulatory sandbox, which basically means that if you have players who have products in the crypto space, they're invited uh, and given a safe 
ground to test that technology. So the regulator does not stop them from operating, but they invite them and they provide um, a space in which they, 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 they can play in a very controlled environment, controlled in terms of how many customers you can get, uh, the reach of those customers, uh, among other parameters. So it gives time for both the technology people and the regulator to understand the technology. Maybe after six months, both sides will have known what are the risks and developed uh, mitigation strategies which then go into the regulation. So that regulatory sandbox is the best approach for now. Cryptocurrencies are being embraced in the business world in the country. Milano Collections, an apparel store in Ruiru, accepts digital currency as payment from its customers. Uh, so, you see, Bitcoin is the current, let me say, is a current technology that we cannot run away from it. And... Uh, as per se, I can tell you, in a single day, we're receiving like about two, three people with the uh, bitcoins, because we have also advertised ourselves. And uh, I can say people are, are happy about it, especially the young people. The old people, bado waja, shika hii, maneno, because they don't believe in technology or they yet to catch up with this new technology of cryptocurrency. Well, in technology, there are the early embraces, the doubters, and those who the technology has to be forced down their throat. But this shop right here is a perfect example that there are Kenyans who are cashing in big time on the opportunity that cryptocurrency continues to present the business market. We are living in the era of the fourth industrial revolution, which is powered and driven by technology. Blockchain technology and AI are leading the pack in fully living in the era. The earlier we warm up to it, the better for as long as we wait, we are only but procrastinating the inevitable. The Energy Regulatory Commission, in a press statement sent to newsrooms, cancelled the license of Kenya independent fuel distributors for spearheading a strike over the 16% VAT on petroleum products, citing that the boycott is illegal and that there was no miscalculation on the amount that was to be paid by customers once the implementation took effect. Take a look at that report. The boycott has seen most fuel stations across the country report dry pumps, while those that still have stock are experiencing long queues of motorists seeking to refuel. Speaking to motorists in various parts of Nairobi, they cited the challenges they have faced since the fuel levy came into force. Mafuta ya metuadhiri kwa njia kubwa sana. Mwanzo tumekuwa tukifanya kazi nyingi na bei ilikuwa tunalipisha bei yenye kila mtu anaweza. Lakini vile mafuta ilipanda inamaanisha pia lazima sisi tuongeze bei. Lakini kwa kuongeza hiyo bei mteja hawezi akakubali ile biashara ulikuwa unapiga una naye mwanzo anaona kama umembadilisha bei kighafla. Mteja akishaamua anatembea sisi inamaanisha kwamba kazi yetu inakuwa chini. Eh? Wengi wameamua kutembea kwa hivyo inamaanisha kazi pia inapungua. Mtoka hapa nikaenda kutafuta mafuta Bellevue. Hii ni petrol station lakini hakuna mafuta. Nimeenda paka Bellevue ndio nikapata mafuta. Yale nimeweka uende ndio ilikuwa hiyo profit. Umeona? So ina maana hata kama pikipiki na mafuta bado kazi iko chini. Pia tena pakwenda kutafuta mafuta imekuwa ni challenge. Tunataka kutafuta mafuta mbali ndio tupate hayo mafuta. Na tukishayapata tena profit inakuwa chini. Serikali ile kitu unafaa wafanye. Pale ilipokuwa ilikuwa 100 kama 13, bado ilikuwa inatuma kidogo lakini tuko najikaza. Lakini sasa hizi imefika 127 bado iko imeenda ikakuwa juu sana. Kwa hivyo tunaomba kama wanaweza ipunguza hiyo bei. Irudi hata kama ile walikuwa wanasema hata kama 100 sawa wajaribu wapunguze hiyo bei itatusaidia. There are so many things that have gone high. You see now you go to the supermarket you find things have been hiked and no one has announced. It's only fuel we had the government saying it has gone up by 16%. But now everything is going up. Yeah, it may affect because uh, I can't transport by the Mepanda, Nikwa Pandia Chwani, same if you 70. 
Eh, mafute mekuwa ni noma sana. Metoka hapa, mekama hapa kwanzia sasaba, saini uh, ulimo saa kumi na nusu inelekea. Uh, bado tunangoja tuone kata pata mafuta. Meleta vitu mob. Mifanya mm, life mekuwa hard juu. Apart from mafuta kupanda ambaka commodities uh, kwa duka zimepanda juu zote. Eh, imekuwa ni tough ash kufika huku mta huku job ju fame hike eh, fame hike food me hike sana na shindwa shindwa gavai natakaje sasa eh sasa penye tunaelekea eh, inabidi hata nikata anza kutembea miguu ah gaba wajue vile anaweza adjust si ni, ni VAT bana iko juu sana iko juu sana sana inatumiza eh kwanza watu middle class na lower class kwanza ndio wanaumia sana the increase in fuel prices in the country will see Kenyans dig deeper into their pockets as the price of various commodities is set to rise with the expected rise in production costs. The rise in prices of petroleum products is seen as a hurdle in the development agenda as various participants in the economy have to pay a higher price for their contribution the price which many are already not able to meet. For Brand Plus TV Business News, I am Daisy Wambua. The decision by the Energy Regulatory Commission and the Kenya Revenue Authority to implement the 16% fuel tax has forced Kenyans to dig deep into their pockets. Pressure has now shifted to the president to sign the bill of suspension of the fuel levy until 2020. But the dilemma is in the binding agreement the government entered into with the International Monetary in 2015 to implement the tax. But do we have any alternative? Our reporter Karari John had a sit down with Michael Wekese, CEO Inborn Energy, a company that develops markets and implements energy programs and solutions to seek an answer to this. The increase of the fuel prices by 16% has forced Kenyans, of course, to dig deep in their pockets. And today we have chosen to seek an expert opinion. That's why I'm joined by Michael Wekesa, the CEO of Inborn Energy. And he will be breaking to us down what this translates to. And do we have an alternative? Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, Asante Sana. Now, you are from Inborn Energy. What does Inborn Energy do? All right. So Inborn Energy is an energy services company. We help our clients to reduce their power bills. Um, that's how. That's actually our statement. Um, and I think this would be a good forum to just sit and share and discuss some thoughts um, on the impact of uh, this increase in fuel prices. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how long has in, uh, uh, Inborn Energy been practicing? or rather being existing? Wow, um, five plus years now. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've uh, been in the industry uh, quite a while. Mm -hmm. And so we are familiar with the different terrain as far as energy is concerned mm -hmm. um, in our landscape. Yeah. Now let us jump now to the increased fuel levy by the, uh, by the Treasury, rather also by also CARE mm -hmm. and uh, the Energy Regulatory Commission. Now there has been a task going on on the implementation of the fuel levy from the stakeholders also complaining about the same. Does this have a direct impact? Yes, it does. Um, uh, it, it has, um, as you can uh, know, I think there are several uh, groups of people um, that would be affected directly. I think for one is uh, the transport sector. Kenya is heavily reliant on uh, fuel uh, public transport system. And I think that would be um, something that would hit hard on them. Uh, those are direct. And then there are also uh, households, especially uh, rural poor households that use uh, paraffin uh, to cook, and it's a substantial number. Um, those would be affected directly. Of course, we have um, industries that use uh, what's called HF4, heavy fuel oil, mm -hmm. uh, to do their production. And this increase is uh, direct on them. Um, and probably um, also applications that are off-grid, places without power, mm -hmm. there are hospitals and health centers that run purely on uh, generators. Um, and so this means their yeah, costs will be way up. Yeah, so directly, I think those are some of the uh, groups that will be affected uh, by this increase. Does it translate to indirect impact? Indirect, yes. Um, 
one of the um, in our electricity bills there's a fuel component um, and so when you look at your Kenya power bill for every user regardless of whatever category um, you pay for fuel and so if this goes up that will translate directly and so that would mean um, increased uh, power bills um, for you know cutting across the different user groups um, I also think indirectly in the sense of petroleum based products uh, those would, that would definitely uh, also go up yeah, so indirectly we are, as a country I think um, both the direct and the indirect um, impact would uh, be quite uh, significant. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, what practices can various stakeholders uh, caution themselves from shock like these of uh, fuel levy prices hiking up, and uh, and how does it translate uh, to an uh, an individual household? Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I think for um, and I'll break it down for maybe households and then organisation. I think a good starting point is uh, knowledge. You know, just do you know how much uh, you use as far as energy is concerned? Our experience has been that um, most people do not quite know. So you get a bill of, say, 4,000 Kenyan shillings in a month, but you can't pinpoint and say, uh, of this 4,000, 2,000 goes here, 1,000 goes here. You cannot quite. So if knowledge is the first point. So when you know in my house, um, this is what consumes the most, then you can take proactive action. Uh, so I think for households, number one is knowledge. Um, once you know, then the next step is uh, saying, how do I become uh, efficient? Um, and uh, we define efficiency in two ways. So number one is using energy efficient uh, product. Uh, common one for household is, is lighting. And it's amazing how people uh, may not just know uh, how much the difference is. If you use LED lighting, you know, this small white light for that, consumes almost five times less uh, compared to this other, um, what we call halogen uh, lights. Um, if you have a four bedroom house and each one, of, each one has uh, that and high consuming halogen lamp, then switching to LEDs um, would be quite significant. Um, and so using equipment that are efficient, I think that's one for the home. Uh, that could be lighting or a couple of other equipment in the home. Um, and number two is user behavior. I think that way uh, families or individuals can cushion themselves. Um, a typical example, what happens is it's dinner time at home, uh, food is ready, uh, but you know people dilly dally here and there, you're watching TV, you're playing, and then you come an hour later, you have to heat the food in the microwave. A microwave is a heavy consumer. Uh, that would definitely um, reflect on your bill. So user behavior in the sense of uh, how efficiently, how do we use our equipment. Um, uh, lighting is another one. Um, you know, I grew up, my dad used to tell me, switch off the light whenever you leave a room. Mm -hmm. Now I know, as I, because I pay the bills. Yes. Uh, yeah, and that, that also is a way that uh, guys can use um, steps that they can take um, to save uh, for individuals. Um, I think any other thing for home would be, um, say, for those who have fridges, storage of food. Um, you find in most households you would put your temperature at max. Um, so unless you're doing ice cream production in your home, just a medium setting. Because if you set it at max, it means it's using more energy and that means uh, more power. Uh, and, you know, if fuel reflects on your bill, then it means your bill will definitely uh, go up. Uh, so I think as, house, as far as households are concerned, uh, that would be one. Um, for, well, let me just mention something else for the households. Uh, I think so, so using solar is also uh, an opportunity because we are in the tropics. We, um, other countries envy what we have in terms of uh, solar resource. Um, and if there's a section of your bill that you could uh, use on solar, uh, it will definitely go a long way in reducing that. Um, for corporate organizations or industries, again, same thing is knowledge. Um, at that large scale, uh, we call it energy audit or energy assessment. So you basically it's just telling you, um, how do I use my energy? What goes where? So the same thing that applies for home at a small scale would apply to a company. 
Um, so you do an assessment of your energy cost, which machines uh, cost us the most in terms of power. Uh, and then after you do that, then you take the next step of efficiency. Uh, does this machine have to run idly? How can we reorganize our production schedules? Mm -hmm. If this is our biggest consumer, um, I'll give you an example, say for supermarkets uh, that have uh, dailies, so they cook for. I think it's important for them to look at their energy costs vis-a-vis -vis the bread or whatever we are producing mm -hmm. and just uh, have a look and say, uh, is this, uh, does it make uh, sense? Um, so I think for organizations is that number one, an assessment, and then um, activities that follow that uh, to just ensure uh, efficiency. Um, same thing, um, and I think this is particularly important for businesses in terms of cushioning themselves. Um, you can say we are not yet a 24-hour economy, right? Sure. And so most of the businesses operate during the day. Mm -hmm. Now, if you can set up a solar solution for your place, you can offset a huge part of your bill because you operate during the day and uh, there are solutions that you work alongside KPLC so you don't have to uh, say I'm off KPLC completely but it's actually a complementary. Uh, so during the day you can offset 50-60% uh, if you run on solar. I think um, for organizations that do massive production um, that would be a huge saving. Yeah. So I, I think just uh, so some of the things that uh, individuals, households and organizations can do mm -hmm. yeah, to yeah. cushion themselves. Now as a country, mm. whether these uh, fuel prices they stay or they get scrapped out, we need to rethink about our energy sources. And what are the alternatives that we can adapt in the short term and in the long term run? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's a very good thing you mentioned. I, th I think it's a wake up call. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, this uh, bill has been there six, since 2016, it's just a postponement. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it's something with us as a country, we have uh, a way of being jacked to action. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is a good time. I think in the, um, in the short term, uh, I would say um, efficiency, mm -hmm. and efficiency is def the way we define it is um, making use, how do I make the most use of the available resources. Um, and efficiency, like I mentioned, starts with uh, just an assessment uh, of what we have. And it's efficiency at household level, uh, organization level, but also um, as a country. Um, and then just saying, uh, you know, what costs us the most. Um, I think we have, um, and it's been mentioned a couple of times, um, uh, we have... Um, producers um, that are on standby, and this is, I'm talking about production of power to the national grid, um, that run on diesel, uh, and they are very pricey. Um, I think um, there's an, uh, there's currently I think there's an energy bill uh, before parliament uh, being debated. I think it has a couple of changes. I think that would help uh, in the short term. Uh, in the long run, of course, is to, uh, as much as possible, go renewable. Uh, we are doing a lot um, as it is compared to many countries because we are uh, on geothermal a uh, very significant percentage. Uh, so geothermal um, and then also combining that with solar and wind and reducing uh, the amount of energy that we produce as a country um, from especially uh, sources that are powered uh, by diesel. I think as a long-term uh, solution, those are some of the things. We also have um, government policies that are, are not friendly. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. Um, in developed nations, um, there's what we call net metering. So if I have my household, or like you know, uh, this organization here, uh, and I'm, I want to power my operations on solar, um, I can consume power that I produce. The excess power I can actually sell to uh, Kenya Power. I can sell to the grid. You see that framework does two things. Number one is it um, incentivizes um, you know, uh, individuals or businesses to actually set up solar, renewable uh, and affordable, so to speak, because if you can send, uh, if you can sell back, uh, then it means uh, you know, your payback period is um, a bit short. Um, so I think in terms of uh, policy, I know it's again something in the energy bill, uh, under consideration. I think in the long term, um, 
those are some of the policies that the government should put in place uh, very specifically to say we want to encourage uh, guys to uh, go into renewable energy. What are some of the incentives? Um, it's a good thing at the moment that uh, solar uh, products, and I say solar a lot because it's a great resource that we have, um, they are tax exempted, uh, which I think is a good thing, and the government should uh, now you know, just say how do we make the most of this. Yeah. Um, I think those uh, things that would go a long way in helping us as a country say these are the resources that we have in terms of energy production and this is the most that we are making of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. As important as is energy uh, uh, source, mm -hmm. its management also is important. Yeah. Now, what is energy management? Energy management is um, it's, a, it's a science. It's um, basically like um, any other management is applied to business uh, or production in agriculture. It's saying um, what just having a look at uh, what resources you have, uh, how do you plan your resources, how do you allocate which resources to what. Um, so again, back to what I said, energy management uh, goes back to knowledge. Um, in order for you to manage your energy properly, you need to know where your energy is going. You need to know what your biggest energy consumers are. Um, and then uh, once you know that, then you can allocate appropriate resources on whatever consumption you have. So um, energy management applies at a home level, at an organizational level, at a country level. Um, uh, so uh, that energy management in general, just saying how do we become proactive in managing this resource uh, that we have. Uh, yeah. Is this undertaking only for organization because it seems maybe complex? And actually, no. Um, and I, again, like I said, it's when you go to, when you talk to someone who, you know, have a conversation, someone tells me, my power bills are really high. Mm -hmm. uh, so I always ask them, so what you have in your house? What consumes what? So energy, it, it doesn't have to be um, at an organizational level. Um, it's something that can be done at whatever level. You can start with your household and say, Guys, you can call a family meeting, uh, you know, and tell them this is our bill, and we realize that uh, the shower, the microwave, or the cooker is what is uh, consuming a lot of this. So, a proactive energy management is saying, you know what, uh, when dinner time is uh, here, mm -hmm. we won't be heating food in the microwave. That's energy management mm -hmm. because you're taking proactive. So it's at whatever level, um, small scale in terms of household as an enterprise and also as a nation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, as an energy expert, what are your aspirations for the country as much as, part, uh, as much as energy is concerned for the future? For the future? Um, I, I think, first of all, is to uh, just make the most of the resources that we have. Um, we have. We have a great resource in uh, solar energy, a great resource. Kenya is, um, you know, right at the equator, uh, cutting through. Um, and for um, us, looking at the future of energy, uh, we see a lot of investments in uh, solar power, not just um, at a big scale, uh, but also uh, for small scale applications, if it's for home or for um, businesses. Yeah, and uh, that's the direction that we are going, mm -hmm. uh, just to help um, to work with individuals and organizations. Uh, to say, hey, look here, uh, this is the way you can make the most uh, out of your power. Um, and um, we see it as a, a bright future, mm -hmm. so to speak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you so much for having me. As a defender. As a as the country moves forward, a conversation about alternative energy sources should be had. For Brand Plus TV, I am Krari John Wambugu. Now back to you, Ondiro. Now let's shift gears and take a look at the day's market performance and here is a summary.
the markets performed today, but for more in-depth analysis, tune in tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. for my next Big Bet with Rachel Dorito and Karanja Daniel as they carry out an in-depth analysis of the financial markets and other investment opportunities available for you. That's all the time we had tonight on Business News Desk. On behalf of everyone that made it a success, thank you very much for watching. Good night. We'll see you tomorrow, same time, same place. Enjoy the rest of your day.